Welcome everyone. This is our very first MPRE crash course and we are so pleased to have Amy with us who is a brand new bar prep instructor and also what we consider an expert in the MPRE. And we're going to structure this course over two days. So Amy's going to break the material in half and we're going to do half tonight and then half tomorrow. And without taking anything away from the instructor, Amy, it's a the floor is yours, and we'd love to learn everything about the MPRE. Thank so you, Andrew. I just need to give you uh, the capability of sharing screen, and let me do that real quickly. All right, perfect. Go ahead, Amy. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, so the thing that I'm going to share here actually comes directly from the NCBE, the guys that make the, the MPRE for us and portions of the bar exam, depending on your jurisdiction. Um, and this is how we're going to break down the subject matter for the purposes of studying, um, because they tell us per, by percentage what's going to be tested on the exam. So what we're going to try and cover tonight is going to include the regulation of the, the legal profession that covers six to 12 percent of the exam. Uh, the client and lawyer relationship is 10 to 16 percent of the exam. Client confidentiality is six to 12 and conflicts of interest, 12 to 18 um, then we get into competence, legal malpractice, and other civil liability for 6 to 12%. And then we'll cover parts of the litigation and other forms of adv advocacy, but that's right about our midpoint. Um, so they give you they give you a pretty fair breakdown of how many questions of each section you're going to see out on the test. And just a reminder, the test itself is 60 multiple choice questions. That includes some um, some not test questions. Um, I can't remember the word, but they're testing out the questions on you. You get to be the guinea pigs. Experimental. So, okay, that's it. Experimental. Not every question is going to count, but you shouldn't waste time trying to figure out what is an experimental question and what is not. Um, and just answer the questions as best as you can. Um, so e we can just go into each one of the, the subjects here. Um, and we'll start with the, the regulation of the legal profession. So of starting with powers of courts and other bodies to regulate lawyers, the courts have broad powers to regulate lawyers and the legal profession itself. So in each jurisdiction, um, just about all state constitutions give the state Supreme Court power to regulate the legal industry. And that's where bar organizations derive their power from. So I'm in Florida, the Florida bar gets its power directly from the Supreme Court they're an administrative agency of the judiciary of Florida. Um, so that's where their powers come from. Some other powers that the court has when it comes to lawyers is the power to sanction, uh, which is very important when you get into discovery disputes and, and you're in you're in trial. Um, but that's where that's where the powers sort of come from. Um, and then underneath uh, the powers of the court and the regulation, of course, is admission to practice. So that's also governed by those state agencies. Um, so the Supreme Court gives guidance to the Florida Bar, and then the Florida Bar gives guidance to the Florida Board of Bar Examiners with regard to admission. Um, as far as the, the model rules of professional conduct goes, what you need to know about admission is that uh, lawyers have to have graduated with a Juris Doctorate from an ABA accredited school, um, and they have to take a bar exam, whichever one the jurisdiction that they seek to practice in requires. So some states take the MBE, other, or I'm sorry, the uh, the UBE and other states have their own state exam. Um, once admitted, a lawyer is actually under the jurisdiction of the Board of Bar Examiners for their first year of practice, not the Florida Bar with regard to, or I'm sorry, not the bar um, with regard to, to lawyer discipline. Um, sorry um and misconduct is generally ha handled by the bar after admission um and then there's various there's various forms of misconduct and whether or not those things need to be reported have to do with um sorry with the with the nature of the conduct itself so it's sorry i've pulled up another window here and i don't know if it's showing yeah, we can see. Oh, well, we could for a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me make this bigger so that everyone can see it. I'll pause. No, this is really good so far. 
Amazing. I'm we can see it. Just trying to get through it. Okay. Um, so this is just a more long form, long form version of the, the same sort of information. We've got the same stats. Um, so as far as reporting goes, a lawyer or a judge who knows that another lawyer or judge has committed misconduct or a violation of the rules um, has to report it, but only they only must report it if it raises a substantial question as to the person's honesty or trustworthiness or fitness to practice. So a lot of this test turns on knowing must or may with with regard to reporting so you should any any situation that you run into a rule like this reporting rule you should highlight that it is must for a substantial question as to the person's honesty trustworthiness or fitness as a lawyer if it doesn't if it doesn't impact any of these qualities then you may report it but you're not compelled to report it and again that's that's another lawyer that knows of the of the misconduct. Um, obviously, reporting yourself would be kind of crazy. So you're not there. There aren't really many must report yourself rules. Um, then we get into the unauthorized practice of law, which ties into admission to practice and regulation of the of the profession. So a lawyer can employ people like paralegals and legal assistants to do non or to do legal work. But ultimately, it's the supervising attorney's um, responsibility to supervise all of their work. And that's true of a supervising attorney. We'll get into this a little bit later, but that's that's true of a supervising attorney with a younger attorney or a, a less a less senior attorney as well. Um, that that less senior attorney can't say, oh, I was just following orders um, when the senior attorney tells them to do something that's unethical. They have to use their judgment unless it's a a question that can be fairly argued either way. Um, then they can they can sort of say, well, my boss told me to do it. Um, then as far as admission to practice, there's multi-jurisdictional practice. So this gets a, a little bit weird, but you know there you get admitted to a bar and then you can practice in that jurisdiction. Um, if you say want to be in-house counsel at a company, you just have to be admitted in a bar and then you can be in-house counsel. Um, there are other situations where you can work with a lawyer in the jurisdiction that you want to practice in if you haven't been admit admitted. Um, that's where you're practicing on a, tempor a temporary basis that bears a reasonable relation to your practice and you have to associate with a local lawyer. There's also um, a, a case where down here they call it special permission to practice. You may have heard that called uh, its Latin name, Pro Hoc Vice which is where the court allows you to be admitted for that specific matter only. Um, and if you want to gain admission after, you still have to apply like a regular applicant. Uh, the only other case where you can practice without a license is in a mediation or arbitration, but that matter has to arise out of your home state. So kind of like kind of like when you're trying to establish a uh, jurisdiction, you know, you, you, you're talking about the nucleus of operative fact. So if, if that stuff happens in your home state and the mediation has to occur somewhere else, that's okay. You can also conduct depositions of witnesses out of state without being licensed in, uh, in the, the forum of the deposition state. That's not something that you have to get pro hoc status for. Um, a non-lawyers can't form partnerships with lawyers for any activities that constitute the practice of law. This is an interesting one because the way they ask this question on the test is commonly um, where you'll have a lawyer and a non-lawyer who say, uh, uh, you know what, an accountant who who's not a lawyer, but sometimes does things that look like practicing law and they're gonna share an office space. Um, so the the problem with that is we know that you don't necessarily need a partnership agreement to form a partnership. If you share a building with a non-lawyer and you guys you guys give uh, services to the public that look like legal services, you can, in fact, uh, be be charged by the bar with forming a partnership with a non-lawyer. Um, now, just a reminder, on this test, we're using the model rules of professional conduct. This varies by jurisdiction. So there are some jurisdictions that allow lawyers and non-lawyers to form partnerships, even in law firms. But because we're dealing with the model rules, that's a no-no. Um, we spoke or we talked briefly about subordinate lawyers. Um, that's that's where 
you can't just defer to what your your senior attorney told you to do if there's a que an ethical question involved. You can only do that if there's an arguable question of professional duty. Um, that's the only place that 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 sort of will protect you there. Um, otherwise, it's up to your own professional judgment and ethical judgment to to make the call on whether or not you want to do the thing that they've asked you to do. Um, and then last in this section, the sale of a law practice, you can sell the entire practice. You have to give written notice to each and every client. The fees to the clients can't increase when the new when the new people keep running the practice. Um, and the seller has to stop um, engaging in the private practice or that area of practice. So um, the, the practice that I'm involved in is a medical malpractice firm. If we wanted to sell our firm, we would have to give notice to each and every one of our clients. Uh, the new firm wouldn't be able to increase the fee. And I would ha either have to stop practicing entirely, or I would have to stop practicing in the, in the area of medical malpractice. So if I wanted to be in the same geographic area, maybe I could I could do criminal defense. That That's enough of a difference that it could be could be far enough away. Um, just want to check my roadmap here. Let's see. So fee divisions with a non-lawyer, you're not allowed to split fees or profits from a law firm with a non-lawyer. That's the same thing as not having a partnership with a non-lawyer. Um, you can pay reasonable bonuses to staff members, even if they're not lawyers, uh, but they can't. it can't be out of the, the fee that you get on a case. Um, law firms and other forms of practice, we discussed briefly that lawyers when, when you're working together, you kind of share ethical responsibility. So you have senior attorneys, but senior attorneys aren't the only, aren't the sole people responsible for every action of the of the junior attorneys. Um, and we discussed briefly the responsibilities of the partners and the managers with regard to subordinate lawyers, uh, restrictions on the right to practice. Um, I think what they're implicating here is that you generally lawyers can't be held to a non-compete when they leave a law firm. Um, it, it's a, it's an impermissible restriction on a lawyer's right to practice. So if you see a question on the exam that some, Sally leaves her, her law firm and the law firm has her sign a non-compete, uh, you're gonna know that that's not valid because it would be an impermissible restriction on her right to practice. So that covers already about six to 12% of the exam, it says. Uh, and we can we can move on to the formation of the or I'm sorry, the lawyer client relationship. Um, actually, give me just a second. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Usually pretty straightforward stuff, right? Um, yeah, I, I've always been interested in the pro hoc vice, uh, and I know you pronounce it better than me, but what does that really mean? And if you're explaining that to like a non lawyer, like what circumstances can someone who's admitted in Florida practice uh, or, or, you know, litigate a case in Georgia? So I had one of the, the partners in my firm actually got pro hoc status on a on a case and it was through Texas. Uh, and the way it ended up working was the plaintiff, which was our client, was a resident of Texas and then moved to Florida and retained us in the case. So the case itself, all of the facts and all of the defendants and all of all, all of everything but the plaintiff was in was in Texas. So we know the venue for the case was proper in Texas. That's where we had to bring it. Um, so you you basically you file in the court and ask to be admitted specially for this particular matter. Um, and it is very often one of those situations where it is either the plaintiff or the defendant has moved into a different state. Mm -hmm. cool. um so you also there are also some situations where big firms will have like national trial council um and they'll get pro hoc vice status at the beginning of a big case um we we handled a couple tobacco cases for the plaintiff and the defense firms for rj reynolds and for uh philip morris would have national trial council so they have a local defense firm here that handles the nuts and bolts of the case until it makes it to trial. And then National Trial Council will come in after getting pro hoc vice status so that they can they can be past the bar in the court uh, so they can speak in the well of the courtroom for that specific case. Cool. And just, you know, 
something that was interesting. I saw that uh, Marlboro had to have a big sign out in the gas station that says, even cigarettes that are advertised as less tar have the same amount of tar and such. So that's right. And they had to, they had to roll back, you know, they used to, they called c- certain cigarettes lights, camel and marble. Yeah. Lights. They had to change the name in the late 2010s um, because it would lead people to believe that they were healthier or less tar and they're not. So they had to change it. It's now Marlboro lights are, are Marlboro golds and the camel lights are called camel blues. So <laughs> no, I never knew that. Yeah. Those are, those are really fun cases. You learn a lot of stuff about the tobacco industry that you wish you didn't know. <laughs> sure. All right. Let's see what's going on with the client lawyer relationship. And this seems to be very important. It seems to be the most individually heavily tested right it is it's a really big section because they care a lot about it and in practice it's it's a really big section and i i deal with it day day in and day out uh so it's it's something that you you got to know for beyond the mpre um as far as formation of a lawyer client relationship goes that's a subjective test it's not an objective, okay, the lawyer and the client signed a contract and now they have a relationship. Or like you see in the movies, uh, I think that I think they do it in Better Call Saul where it's like, hey, give me a dollar and you've retained me and now I'm your client or now you're my client and we can have confidentiality. Um, it's not every a- anything that's that clear cut. It's where uh, a client can subjectively believe that or reasonably believe rather that they have a a client lawyer relationship. And that just means that they've gotten legal advice from you, um, which kind of, kind of seems like an obscure term, right? Like what is legal advice exactly? But that's, if you take the law and you apply it to facts, that's legal advice. So that's the, the easiest way to, to think about it. But uh, so there'll be questions where, uh, a client will call a lawyer's office and uh, the the lawyer won't want to take the case, but they won't properly communicate that they don't want to take the case. Or there will be some question as to whether or not they did. Like there was a phone call that was missed or uh, or they didn't get a voicemail. So you want to make sure when, when there's any question that you sort of uh, have a paper trail of you ending a, a lawyer client relationship so you have a decline letter or something like that um let's see let me pull this one up okay so they have much better language in this info sheet than i do as far as formation goes but it it kind of reads like contract formation so the person manifests an intent and the lawyer agrees or fails to make it clear that they don't agree that they'll take the client's case. So that's what I was talking about with the decline letter is even if you have a phone conversation with someone, make sure that you've sent them a piece of mail. Um, Hopefully return receipt requested so that you have proof that they got it. Um, As far as decisions go within the the, uh, lawyer and client relationship, the client decides the objectives of the litigation. They always have uh, the final decision as to whether or not to settle or in the context of a uh, of a criminal case, take a plea uh, or to testify, and in both a civil and a criminal matter, whether to waive a jury trial. Um, as far an interesting uh, twist here with decisions is, I've seen questions where client wants to have uncle pay for client's representation. It's very important in the situation where you have a third party payer like the uncle. It's, it's very important to remember that client is the client. So confidentiality and privilege belong to the client. So do the decisions about the objectives and uh, whether or not to settle. So uncle is just a fiduciary, so to speak. He actually doesn't get to know anything about the case unless the client says that's okay. Um, diminished capacity. So even if a client has diminished capacity, the lawyer has to maintain the relationship as far as as reasonably possible. So that means if somebody has, uh, for instance, a guardian because they are um, developmentally handicapped, uh, then you would have to apprise the guardian as much as as is necessary to to help them let the client know what's going on. But the client still ultimately gets to make the decision whether or not they settle, whether or not they take a plea, because they still have those rights. Um, As far as withdrawal goes, uh, a lawyer can withdraw from the representation 
in very certain situations, and we've got caveats. So I'm just going to read this out to you and then we can break it down. Um, a lawyer must withdraw if the representation results in a violation of the if the model rules of professional conduct, if the lawyer's physical or mental condition materially impairs the lawyer's ability to represent the client, or the lawyer is discharged by the client, fired by the client, which they can do for any reason at any time. Um, so those are our must. So that's, uh, if there's gonna be a violation of the model rules, if the physical or mental condition of the lawyer would keep them from being able to effectively represent the client, or if the client has fired them. A lawyer may withdraw if they have good cause, uh, or it, this is good cause includes where if the lawyer finds the, the client's cause to be morally repugnant is some phraseology that's used in the model rules. Um, I, I'm trying to think of an example and I might get to one eventually, but... Uh, morally repugnant is a good phrase to remember but that's those are some that's some some example of good cause um the the lawyer should give reasonable notice to the client they should refund any advance that the client has paid um and they should re return all of the documents that the client has given to them so as far as advances go there are some clients that take or i'm sorry there are some attorneys that take a retainer at the beginning of their representation, and then they will bill from that retainer as the representation goes on. So let's say client retains lawyer for $5,000. Uh, lawyer decides to withdraw after doing $2,500 worth of legal work. The lawyer must return the rest of the $2,500 of that original $5,000 retainer. He must also return. So I, I do medical malpractice. We get lots and lots of medical records from clients. Uh, we have to give them any of those papers and any papers that we got um, uh, on behalf of the client so that they can go return, retain new counsel if they'd like. That's the purposes of returning the, the papers themselves. Um, so in certain situations, you also have to get leave of court to withdraw. Uh, if, if it's at a stage in the litigation that would uh, materially affect the client, then the, the court may keep you from withdrawing from a case, regardless of any possible uh, violation of, of rules or uh, or the ability to represent the client. It's just a case-by-case -case basis. And like I said, that that depends on where in the litigation you are. Um, but if you're if you're a week a week out from trial, uh, in a murder case, the judge is not going to let you withdraw because that would that would put your client in a really bad situation. And it's about making sure that the client still has effective representation. Um, so you have a duty to keep your your clients informed about about the important happenings in a case. So if you're if you're handling a civil a civil case, you don't necessarily need to let your your client know every time you've gotten a response to interrogatories. But you do need to let them know when you filed the complaint, uh, when you're going to have uh, a deposition of a of a major witness. You should you should keep your client reasonably informed. Um, and to that end, make sure that you keep records of keeping your clients reasonably informed because <laughs> it's always important to be able to to prove that you're you're doing what's ethically required. Um, fees. I love talking about fees. They're super fun. Um, fees have to be communicated in advance and they have to be reasonable. So it, according to the, the model rules, contingent fees, you have to have two different two separate writings one at the beginning of the of the the case where you explain what a contingency fee is the details of the contingency fee and how that breaks down so for instance if you have a 30% fee uh plus costs you have to make sure that the client knows whether or not your fee includes the costs or if those are in addition to the costs um and that that gets a little bit that might be a little bit more of a jurisdictional thing actually but uh that's that's where it gets interesting. So the the writing at the beginning of the case, that can be your contract. Uh, so client agrees to retain lawyer for a 30% contingent fee. Uh, and there are some different jurisdictional breakdowns as to where in the litigation you can get what max percentage. Uh, but generally 30, 30, 40% is a good max number. Um, but they're writing at the beginning of the case 
tells tells them how the fee will be calculated and what the amount is. And the one at the end says what the recovery is, what all of the fees and costs are, and ultimately what the client will recover themselves individually. So that's that's the important part of that. That's called a closing statement generally. Um, so that's that shows what the outcome is and what recovery the client is entitled to. Um, contingent fees aren't allowed in every single context. You can't have a contingency in certain family law matters. Um, so as according to the model rules, it's no family law matters. There are some little exceptions in there jurisdictionally. Um, and you can't have contingency fees in criminal cases in any context. Um, fee sharing is always an interesting thing too. So lawyers from different firms can share fees according to the model rules only if the if the work is proportion to the division of the proportional to the division of the fee. So uh, certain jurisdictions allow for for less, but uh, for the purposes of this test, if two lawyers share a case and one lawyer does 60% of the work and the other lawyer does 40% of the work, that's how they split the fee. So uh, I don't I don't think they make you do math on the test, so I won't come up with a math example, <laughs> so, but that's the way it works out. So if the total fee is 30%, they'll split that 30% according to the amount of work that they both did. Um, so that is, it seems pretty straightforward, but there are a lot of different ways that they can ask you about the lawyer-client relationship. Um, it like we talked about earlier with regard to retaining lawyers in the beginning, whether or not the lawyer re or the client reasonably believes that there's a a client lawyer relationship, um, third parties paying fees for lawyers, uh, what you have to do when you withdraw. Let's see if we've got any more on this list here. Counsel and assistance within the bounds of law seems kind of obscure, uh, but there are certain things that you're precluded from doing for your clients. You, you are allowed to advance certain fees to a client, but you cannot give your client a loan. So uh, if you're, say you're bringing a civil case, there are filing fees, there are uh, fees uh, associated with expert witnesses for things even as small as copies you can advance those costs to your client. Uh, and civil attorneys commonly do, especially those that get paid on contingency. Um, costs that you can't advance, for instance, if you have a criminal client and uh, they can't afford bail, you can't pay your client's bail. If you have an indigent client, you, cannot, you can't pay to put them up in an apartment. Um, so just the only things that you can really advance are costs of lit associated with the litigation. And that's reasonably associated with the litigation. So if you could, I, like I could find a way to make an argument that uh, that an apartment would be necessary for an indig indigent client for the course of our litigation, but I don't think that the bar would accept that. <laughs> so it's it reasonable bounds of the law. Um, and that that gives us most of the, the lawyer-client relationship. Uh, are there any questions about that section? No, you know, I notice, especially if you've taken the bar, very similar of the ethics that's tested on the bar, especially when it comes to contingency fees and referral fees. You know, you pretty much have to memorize them for an ethics essay. So, you know, contingency fees are not, they have to be calculated, they have to be reasonable, and then um, they're not appropriate in domestic matters. Or you said maybe some small exceptions, but for the most part, not in domestic matters or criminal matters. And then the thing with referral fees, it has to be from another attorney and the attorney has to somehow partake in the representation. I, that's kind of the general idea. Maybe in practice, you don't see it so much, but as a general way of thinking about it ethically, the lawyer should get the consent of the client and be um, a helping hand on the case. Right. Um, and the places that vary from that, uh, the places that don't require it to be split solely on the amount of work that's done, those they generally will require shared legal responsibility of the lawyers. So right. if it's not based on how much work it's done, it gets done by each lawyer, it's based on how much responsibility and liability the lawyer is willing to assume for the representation of that client. Um, so it's... It's, it's usually pretty interesting. I get to do that one too a lot. <laughs> um, 
So another really important section on the MPRE is client confidentiality. And this one gets a little bit hairy because people confuse it with privilege, especially if you end up taking the MPRE before you've taken the bar, because um, that's really when a lot of people suss out the difference. Um, so let's see if this starts at the top. It does. Okay. So attorney-client privilege is an evidentiary rule. It governs a court or other government entity from using its powers to compel the revelation of confidential communications between an attorney and a client. Um, the client holds the privilege and it lasts forever. So in pop culture, you see sometimes where like, oh, my client died and now I can finally tell everybody where he buried the bodies. Uh, that's not the way it works. It, it, uh, it survives the client. Um, and it survives even the attorney uh, if the firm survives the attorney. So just to kind of demystify some of that, it's it's important to remember that this is an evidentiary rule. So it, it really only works to keep things out of court. Uh, and what we're trying to keep out of court is stuff that is the legal advice that we talked about earlier that you gave your client. That's the stuff that we're talking about. It's also important to remember what what things destroy privilege. So if you're having a meeting with your client and your client has their cousin in the room with you, that is not a privileged communication. If if you're if you're having a meeting with your client and your client has their mother in the room with you, that's generally not a privileged communication. Uh it gets a little bit wonky in situations where the attorney has hired someone to work for them like an investigator or an expert witness there's some question as to whether or not those are privileged but that stuff ends up being covered by the work product doctrine which is a different thing entirely from attorney client privilege so that's that's kind of where it gets wonky um distinct from privilege still is confidentiality so we talked about how the privilege lasts forever confidentiality also survives death of the client or the attorney. Um, the, the way that it's different though, is that attorney client privilege belongs, belongs to the client and the client can waive it if they so choose. Confidentiality is something that is required of the lawyer. It's a duty of the, of the attorney. And it's, you, you can't reveal any information that's re that is relating to the representation unless the client gives informed consent and then disclosure or the disclosure is impliedly authorized to carry out the representation or the disclosure is permitted. So we've got some exceptions here that we'll go through, but let's start with informed consent. Um, informed consent doesn't have to be in writing. It's good if you get it in writing, um, but you have to tell the client what the pros and con cons are of revealing the confidential information. That's where we get into impliedly authorized. Um, I, I mentioned I, I work in medical malpractice. I have to talk to expert witnesses about the medical conditions of my clients so that I can retain the expert witnesses. This is not a breach of confidentiality because it's impliedly authorized that I talk to medical experts about the condition of my client for the purposes of the case. So that's that's just an example of where, it's, it, where you have implied authorization. Um, and then you have certain situations where it's permitted, there's not a situation where you must breach confidentiality. Um, that's th This is not compelled. So you may breach confidentiality in these situations. So certain death or great bodily harm. So if it is reasonably certain that death or great bodily harm will result from not revealing confidential information, you may reveal it not must, may. Um, crime or fraud in which the lawyer's services have been used. That is a situation where, again, you you may. Um, in certain situations, there might be a must, but that's because another model rule has laid on top. For instance, candor to the tribunal. Um, so if, if your client's doing crime or fraud in the courtroom, you have to correct that because you have a duty to, to provide candor to the tribunal. Um, Compliance with the rules to secure legal advice about the lawyer's compliance with these rules. I don't, not everybody's aware, 
When you're a member of the bar, they have an ethics hotline. You can call them. It's anonymous. And you can tell them, hey, this is what's going on. I need to know what I should do. And they will usually point you to the relevant ethics opinion by the bar so that you can you can figure out what course you should take. Uh, and it's never a bad idea to call them and ask if you have questions. Uh, or there are also bar attorneys who deal only with these ex these ethical rules and the bar and the board of bar examiners and it's always good to know a bar attorney <laughs> for these for these questions um so controversy between the lawyer and the client you are allowed to reveal con confidential information if you need to establish a claim or, or defense on behalf of yourself so what does that mean your client suing you for malpractice and you have to talk about the case that you were handling for them so that you can prove that you didn't do the malpractice. That's that's what they mean by to establish a claim or defense. Um, I, similarly, if you were if you were if you had another, mm, I'm trying to think of a, a a way that it would establish a claim. Oh, your client doesn't pay. Uh, or at the end, you have funds in a trust account and your client disputes the amount of money that you're entitled to. Uh, so you could reveal confidential information to establish uh, that you have claim to the lawyer or to the to the money that's in the, the trust account. Um, you can reveal confidential information if the court orders you to. You can do anything if the court orders you to. But especially if the court orders you to, you have to you have to reveal the confidential information. Um, and then conflicts of interest. This is a really important uh, thing that we're going to have to return to in the next section. Um, but to detect and resolve a conflict of interest, you you have to reveal certain confidential information, like who, like what the client's name is. Um, so it's very important to remember which situations you can breach confidentiality. But also remember that there's generally, well, I guess court order would be one, but there generally aren't many situations where you must disclose confidential information. Um, Is there a situation, or am I confusing it, where it's like if two people are uh, in, they're on the same side, like we're co-defendants, but then they end up in subsequent litigation against each other? Is that related to this? Um, I think so. I think that has, so you mean if they start out with joint representation? Like, let's say you're the attorney for me and EJ and we, EJ and I are, um, co-plaintiffs or co-defendants, let's say co-plaintiffs. And right. then we have a privileged communication because him and I are, are co-parties, but then later him and I end up in a dispute that conversation that was had between you, EJ, and myself is no longer privileged because we had it in front of each other, right? I think, so I think the way that ends up working is because you and EJ are the clients, you hold the privilege. So if, if you two had a dispute and you needed to disclose that information, then you would be able to waive the privilege. Um, and then when, with regard to like criminal defendants, that goes up to, uh, the lawyer client relationship. So if you have criminal defendants and, uh, by representing both of them, there would be, um, sorry, I'm trying to find the, the relevant part. Maybe I won't. Um, if, if between the two of them there, that would create a conflict of interest to, to give them adequate representation, you would have to withdraw from, from representation of one of those defendants or make a motion to sever. There's probably multiple ways to handle that. Um, but that's that's another place that that comes in is whether or not it creates a conflict for you to represent two people in the same matter. Nice. Um, so what's the game plan? How many more sections do we have today? Um, let's check our, our big roadmap. So... We just got through client confidentiality. We've got conflicts of interest and maybe competence to go through. All right, let's do it. We've got some time. Yeah, conflicts of interest, a huge one. And it you is. were saying that it's a little bit different than confidentiality. Confidentiality is um, protection of information that is private, whereas conflict of interest is going to relate to an attorney who may have represented another client or another matter which would put them in 
a compromising situation. So they may right. or must be required, probably may. And most times it's it's going to be their obligation only if they feel like they cannot adequately handle the representation. But you'll tell us more. So right. let's hear about it. So the, the way it ties in um, is that you're allowed, people don't realize uh, confidentiality includes that you are representing someone. So you are allowed to to uh, divulge that you are representing someone for the purposes of doing a conflicts check, uh, which you should do anytime you take a client. Um, but current client conflicts, uh, a lawyer can't represent a client if the uh, representation would involve, and they use the word concurrent, a concurrent conflict of interest. And that has to exist uh, when the representation of one client would be directly adverse to the other client. So you can't represent plaintiff and defendant in the same suit. That's a no-no. Um, or there's a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to another client a former client, a third person, or by personal interest of the lawyer. So this is like where we were talking with the crim about the criminal defendants. If you have two criminal defendants that you're representing and they're going to be tried together, then that might not materially limit your ability to represent them. But if they're going to be tried separately, or if one of them is going to give a statement and they're going to take a plea for some immunity, you can't represent both of those defendants because your representation of one or both of them will be materially limited by your responsibilities to the other. Um, that goes for former clients as well. So if you represent a plaintiff against, let's say, a pharmaceutical company, um, I'm sorry, it works better with defense. So if you represent a pharmaceutical company against a plaintiff uh, and later a different plaintiff comes to you and says, hey, bud, will you take my case? It seems pretty good. You wouldn't be able to take it because you had previously represented the pharmaceutical company. Um, sometimes you can get your client to consent to a conflict. So in that that example where you had previously represented someone, there there can you can still represent them if you reasonably believe that you can provide competent and diligent representation as long as it's not prohibited by law um and again you can't you can't do it in the same litigation but that like we we discussed earlier informed consent doesn't have to be written in this context it does if you're going to have a, a client waive a conflict you need to give informed written consent um Former clients, if a lawyer had formerly represented a client in the matter, uh, they shouldn't represent another person in a same or substantially related matter if that person's interests are materially adverse to the interests of the former client. So just like we talked about with the, the pharmaceutical company, that would be material ad materially adverse, again, unless you get informed consent confirmed in writing. Um, so this works a little bit a, a little bit funky once you get into law firms. So of course we know how it works with conflicts with one lawyer, but what does it do when you've got two, three, four lawyers sharing the same roof? Um, so it's similarly, but if you're retaining a new client, um, then you can screen the lawyer that, that has had uh, a conflict with that client in the past. But let's I'll, I'll get back to the, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> um, so if you, uh, if you acquire confidential information in one firm and you move to another firm, you can't use that confidential information in a new case. Um, if you have, I'm sorry. Okay, this is what I was talking about. So uh, conflicts of a lawyer are imputed to the law firm. So if, if you associate with a law firm, then you can't, even if they represented a client before you started working there, you can't represent someone that has materially adverse interests to that previous client. Um, that, what is this? Sorry. This is one of the first times I'm looking at this, this info sheet. Um, this is what I was talking about with the screening. Mm -hmm. If you if you have an imputed conflict, so if Andrew and I are in the same firm uh, and I've just started and I bring conflicts with me into the into the firm, I can be screened 
meaning I can be cut off from any information with regard to the matter that there's a potential conflict in. Um, and I also can't get paid on the matter. And there should be a written notice sent out to the former client that's involved. Um, and so no interactions with the new client, notice to the former client, uh, and no fee from the matter. Um, as far as, oh, this is fun, transactions with, with, uh, with clients. You can't enter a business transaction with your client. There are certain limited situations where you can. Those situations are where the transaction is fair and reasonable to the client. They get advanced, uh, they get a, an advanced write, writing that says that they should seek independent legal counsel and they have reasonable opportunity to do that. So you can't be like, hey, you should check this, check out this contract. You should maybe have another lawyer look at it. Oop, too late. <laughs> You're taking too much time. Um, so that's, that's, they give you a, a, a mnemonic here of fairies. Um, they also have to give informed consent in writing. Again, this is where we've, we've got the in writing requirement. Um, that writing is going to contain the essential terms of the transaction and the lawyer's role. And it's also going to say whether or not the lawyer is representing them. Um, lawyers cannot accept gifts nor can they uh, solicit any gift from a client uh, unless the lawyer is related to the client. So if you're representing someone, like if you write your aunt's, your great aunt's will, uh, you can you can get a gift from your, from your aunt or you can receive a fee from your aunt. Um, literary or media rights is a, is a thing that they, that they bring up sometimes. Uh, lawyers can't make any deals or negotiations or agreements with regard to the literary or media rights of their clients until after the representation has ended. Um, yes, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, we already talked about how you can't provide financial ex assistance to your clients. Uh, unless you're advancing fees and costs, like I like I said before, it's got to be in connection with litigation and it's reasonable connection, uh, not just an argument that you can make. Uh, a lawyer can also can't acquire any proprietary interest in the cause of action or the subject matter of litigation. So what does that mean? If you're if you're if you've got a case that's about a piece of property, you can't be given a stake in the piece of property or a stake in the business. Uh, instead of a fee. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, exceptions are contingent fees, I guess. That makes sense. It's worded a little bit funny. Sorry, it threw me off. Um, and then we talked a little bit about compensation from a third party. You have to get informed consent when there's a third party. So if your uncle is going to pay for your your criminal legal representation, you're, you're, you have to give informed consent and your uncle can't interfere at all with the relationship that you have with your lawyer. They are literally just paying. That extends to confidentiality. You have to keep all that information confidential. Um, malpractice liability. You can't have a contract that says that you are uh, you that you're not liable for legal malpractice unless the client is represented by another lawyer at the time. Um, that they're making the agreement. That is a model rule that varies jurisdictionally. A lot of jurisdictions say no, not at all, but the model rules allow for it if they have independent counsel. Um, a lawyer can never settle a claim um, with an unrepresented client or a former client unless that person is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek the advice of independent counsel. So what does that mean? If somebody sues you for malpractice and you want to settle with that former client, you cannot settle with them unless they are represented. And they, uh, and well, if they aren't represented, then you should advise them to be represented uh, in writing. <laughs> um, sexual relations, you can't have sex with your clients. Don't do it. Um, unless you were already having sex with them before you started having them as a client, and then you should probably stop anyway. Um, so there's no, don't do the Lincoln lawyer thing. Don't just like, I don't know if you've seen that, Andrew. <laughs> of course, Madden McConaughey. Yeah. It's just, I, it's, I think they made work. a remake now and it's like a TV show. The, t the Netflix one is 
surprising. I've never, I haven't seen the new one, but I've definitely seen the movie with Matthew McConaughey. I don't uh, remember that he was having relations with this client, but see, I was talking about the Netflix one. Oh, okay, yeah. It's yeah. Ve- it's really good. I think you'd like it. You should try it. <laughs> you know what else you mentioned earlier was Better Call Saul, which I've never seen either. You know what's funny is that one. I do, I do like personal injury stuff. I, I can't watch it. it. It's not fast paced enough. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I try to watch it after dinner and then I fall asleep. <laughs> we'll talk about Netflix after. Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's finish up this riveting material. Yeah, we'll we'll finish it up. Okay. Um. So yeah, uh, lawyers or judges that are currently or formerly in government service, they are still subject to conflicts rules. And they may not otherwise represent a client in connection with a matter in which the lawyer participated personally and substantially as a public officer, employee, or judge, or mediator, or as an arbitrator, or as a third party neutral, unless the appropriate government agency gives its informed consent in writing to the representation. Um, So, what exactly does that mean if you're a lawyer for the FBI? Uh, and God, you end up stopping work for the FBI before they prosecute someone, and that person tries to retain you as a defense attorney uh, once you've left the FBI. The only way you could do that is uh, is if the FBI gave you informed consent in writing. And I made it sound that outlandish because it is that outlandish. The governmental agency generally won't give you that. Um, so that is... Oh, and here's a fun exception because arbitrator or third party neutral, an arbitrator that's selected to be partisan in a multi-member arbitration panel is not prohibited from subsequently representing that party. So just in case you're not familiar with arbitration panels, generally there are three arbitrators, one side picks one, the other side picks one, both sides agree on a neutral. If it's one of the partisan arbitrators, that arbitrator could then help with the case, say if it's not a binding arbitration and they wanted to help with the trial. Um, So it looks like, let's see, this should be our last section just about, which is competence, legal malpractice, other civil liability. Uh, Competence and and diligence are duties that are required of lawyers in representing their their clients. They are big ones. Uh, So a lawyer shall provide competent representation and exercise diligence and care. This includes promptness. That's where that that client communications idea comes from. That's competence and diligence. Keeping your client reasonably informed goes to your diligence. Um, Negligence, a plaintiff has to establish, just like any negligence claim, a duty, breach, causation, and harm. Some people say damages, harm is interchangeable there. Um, So, they have to prove if the lawyer had done everything he was supposed to do, I would have damages or I wouldn't have any damages. I would have had a different outcome. And that's the only way that they can prove a claim for, for negligence on the part of the attorney. Um, let's, uh, let's actually cut it off there. Cause I don't want to not pay enough attention to the litigations and other forms of advocacy section. No, that was really amazing. Um, okay. Learned a lot and excited for class tomorrow. Um, anyone have any questions about anything? No, but that was really informative. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.